God's not always going to surround you with people that are going to treat you the way you'd like to be treated. Sometimes He surrounds you with people that don't treat you all that great, and then you find out what's really in you. You know, blessings are often mixed with trouble when we serve God. It's hard when you're doing what's right, and you don't get a right result. You know, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace, the furnace was already hot. I mean, it was before they got in it. The thing was already as hot as hot could be. And when they refused to bow down, which was the right thing to do, the Bible says that the king turned the furnace up seven times hotter than it was before. I've had a lot of times like that in my life where I felt like I was doing the right thing, and yet it seemed like I was the one that got the trouble. Well, what do you do when you're in times like that? You just keep trusting God that He's got His hand on you. He knows what He's doing. And there may be something He's got to work out of you before He gives you the breakthrough that you need. Believe it or not, God uses the furnace to loose the bondages in our lives. We don't grow when everything is easy. Well, thank you for your tremendous response. They were loosed in the furnace. They were in the furnace when they got loosed from their bondages. Can anybody hear me? They weren't laying on the couch eating donuts and watching TV. They got loosed in the furnace. They weren't out in the mall shopping. They got loosed in the furnace. It took me a lot of years to realize that what I thought was my greatest enemies in the long run were my best friends. The Saul's in my life got the Saul's out of me. And if you don't know who Saul was in the Bible, just we don't have time for that message, but <laughs> God's not always going to surround you with people that are going to treat you the way you'd like to be treated. Sometimes He surrounds you with people that don't treat you all that great, and then you find out what's really in you. Oh, God, just help me love the unlovely. So somebody unlovely comes around. Oh, God, I want to be used by you. Please send me to the lost. And then you get a job where you're the only Christian, and you're begging God to get you out of that terrible, awful place because you're the only Christian that works there. Amen. If you can just take hold of this tonight, that no matter what is going on in your life, when a holy God intervenes, there's no reason for any person to go home from this conference discouraged. There is not one reason for anybody to go home, I mean not one thimbleful discouraged, because if God is on your side, it just doesn't matter who is against you. I mean, it really just doesn't matter. And if we stop looking to people and we get our eyes on God, and we get a good attitude and we say, I'm just going to do these two things, God. I'm going to have a good attitude if you'll help me. And I'm going to be a blessing to other people. And you are just going to have to take care of the rest of it. And however long it takes is up to you. Not this, well, God, if you don't change this situation by next week, I just don't know if I can even stay saved. Oh, God gets so tired of hearing us moan and groan and whimper and whine about all of our problems. Thank God I'm not in a furnace. <laughs> Amen. Woo. We have to surrender. And one of the things that we have to surrender is all of our worries and cares and concerns and all this idea that we should worry about things because we might come up with an idea that would fix the problem. Can I just tell you something, and not to be rude, but you are not smart enough to run your own life, and neither am I. We are just plain not smart enough to run our own lives. And we will keep falling flat on our face until we finally realize that. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in about the middle of verse 5, tells us that as long as we keep trying to do things our own way, that God Himself will defeat us and oppose us. 
It doesn't do us any good to take our plan to God and expect Him to bless it. He wants us to go to Him and say, God, here I am. You do whatever you want to in my life. And we're very bad about planning and then praying that God will make our plan work. And what we need to do is pray and let God make the plan. Amen? We drove by an office building over here coming over that was, it's now a hotel and um, it used to be a different hotel and before it was that hotel it was an office building where I worked as a bookkeeper and I was working in that office just a few blocks from here when I met Dave I didn't have transportation to get home and he worked with a guy who lived in a two-family flat that my parents owned and so they came by and picked me up on the corner to give me a ride home and that's how I met Dave Meyer now when I was and then later Dave who was in the engineering field did the heating and air conditioning engineering work for that building that then became the Adams Mark Hotel so a little bit of history on that corner a few weeks from here I mean a few blocks from here but the thing that was amazing to me was when I was there as a bookkeeper I had no idea what I was going to be doing no idea. I was still full of bitterness and misery and trying to control everything. And, you know, I went to church. I was a Christian. But I had no idea what surrender meant. No idea whatsoever. And let me tell you something. That God didn't put us here on the earth just to give us everything we want. We have to make a transition where we come to the point of saying, God, what do you want? What do you want? I'm, I want to lay my life down. I want to say goodbye to me. Goodbye, goodbye. And I want to do what you want me to do. You're not going to be happy. If God gave you everything that you think you wanted right now, I can tell you that it will not make you happy. Because the only way you're ever going to be really happy is when you're right in the middle of God's will for your life. And when you get up every day and say, God, here I am. What do you want from me today? And that doesn't mean God won't let you do a lot of what you think you want to do. But I'm just saying that apart from God, none of it's going to make you happy. And then it says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that in due time he might exalt you, casting all of your care on him. Why don't you make a decision this weekend to surrender everything that disturbs you? Well, God, if you don't change this man I'm married to, I just, this is just not going to work. I just can't do this. Well, yeah, you really could. I mean, if that was what God gave you to do, then he would give you the grace and the joy to do it. And you could, but you're going to have to have a mindset that your joy is in God, not in your circumstances. <laughs> Thank you for one excited lady back there. <laughs> Where are you at? I'll just come and preach to you. And Okay, thank you. Let's put up Isaiah 27, 5. I want to show you this scripture. Or else if all Israel would escape being burned up together, there is but one alternative. Let them take hold of my strength and make complete surrender to my protection that they may make peace with me. Yes, let them make peace with me. So he's saying the only answer, the only way to escape the misery in the world is to come to God and make complete surrender. Now, I can tell you because I've been doing this long enough, I believe with all my heart that, gives me the, that God gives me the right messages for the right crowds. And I tell you what, I love you, love you, love you, love you, love you, but we got some stubborn folks here tonight. I mean, we got some people you've just dug in, honey, and you are going to have it the way you want it. <laughs> and it's time to surrender and say, God, all I want is what you want. I don't care what kind of package it comes in, just give me what you want. Just give me what you want. 
You know, I was, ha I was really happy when I found out that my new book is on the bestsellers list, but you know what? I was just as happy yesterday. And I mean, the reports usually come out on Thursday, so when Thursday went by and I didn't get a call from my publisher, I honestly thought that it didn't make it, and I was still just, praise the Lord, <laughs> it's your book. <laughs> Do what you want to with it. Next day, I got the call. Maybe that day delay was just a little test for me, a little attitude test. See, if you can't be happy, if you don't have what you want, then you're never going to be happy when you get everything you think you want. Let me say that one more time. If you can't be happy when you don't have what you want, then you're never going to be happy when you get everything you want. Oh, you will be for a short while. Yeah, for a little while you will. It's like, oh. <laughs> and that lasts what? Two days, a week, two weeks, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, now I gotta have this other thing that's gonna keep me happy. This other thing that's gonna keep me happy. I remember when I first started doing meetings, the man that was my pastor then, Rick Shelton, I, I don't even know if you remember this, but I remember you telling me this. I was just really unhappy because the little meetings I was doing all over the place were so little, 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 <laughs> disgustingly little, nine people, 20 people, 30 people, and I had a big vision, and anybody who has a big idea doesn't like a little result. Is anybody with me? And I remember him saying to me one day, you know what, Joyce, when your meetings get to be 500, then you'll want them to be 1,000. When they're 1,000, you're going to want them to be 1,500. When they're 1,500, you're going to want them to be 2,000. And You know, Dave asked me the other day how many people were registered for this conference, and I honestly didn't know. I had to give up counting stuff. It's like, whoever's here is here, and I'm going to enjoy them and preach the same, and if it's 10,000, I'm the same, and if it's 15, I'm the same, and if it's 20, I'm the same. Otherwise, my joy is connected to the numbers. Come on. How many books did you sell? How many people are at your meeting? How many people got saved? How many, how many, how much, how much, how much? Oh, I got so tired of that, I couldn't stand it anymore. Preachers count everything, and then they inflate it all. Well, yeah. Oh, I tell you, there must have been 5,000 people. Oh, yeah. I mean, I get invited to these churches. Yeah, we, we can see 5,000. Well, you only got room to park 10 cars. <laughs> and so I go advertise that I'm going to be at this church, and people on t TV watch me come, and then there's no place for them to park their cars, then they're mad. Quit counting everything in your life. I used to lose my joy counting my money that I didn't have. <laughs> the bills would come, and I'd get out the checkbook, and I'd get out the calculator and the bills, and I'd count it all up and get mad and get sad and get depressed and have a fit, and Dave would be in the room next door playing with the kids, and it's like I wasn't miserable enough. I'd rest a little bit, and they'll get it all back out again, do the same thing all over again. Counting stuff can make you miserable. How long did I pray? How many chapters did I read in the Bible? How many? How much? How long do you pray? Oh my gosh, I don't pray as long as you. I must not be as spiritual as you. You mean you read the Bible through every year? I still can't find some of the books, and I've been saved for 30 years. <laughs> Stop counting everything and just get happy. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, yes, I have one of the three biggest churches in the world. Oh, you don't know what you got. We got to surrender.
all of our bright ideas about how things ought to be done. And another thing we have to surrender, and I have to get you to this before we can even go on to tomorrow, you have to surrender everything about you that bugs you. It's time to make peace with your thighs. Tonight, sorry men, you'll just have to put up with this. Tonight, ladies, we are making peace with our thighs. Do the best you can. Exercise off what'll come off. Wear the tightest thing you can find to suck it in. And then just make peace with the rest of it. I don't know what Eve looked like, but I can tell you she didn't look like a stick. I think she had a little meat on her bones. Amen? I made peace with my voice. I mean, people laugh all the time. I called somebody just two weeks ago. I said, no, this is not Mr. Meyer, this is Mrs. Meyer. <laughs> and we don't have time for all those stories, but you just got to make peace with the stuff about you that you don't like. Make peace with yourself. You can't change yourself, but God. You cannot fix yourself, but God. God can do whatever needs to be done in your life. We need to say goodbye to all this self stuff. Let's look at Luke 14 real quick. Luke 14, 31. What king going out to engage in conflict with another king will not first sit down and consider and take counsel, rather he's able with 10,000 to meet him who is coming against him with 20,000. Now, here's the real moral of this story. When you've got a battle to fight, you need to take a look at yourself and say, do I have what it takes to win this battle? No. <laughs> not smart enough, not strong enough, don't know how, no. Can't do it. Verse 32, and if he cannot do so, when the other king is still a great way off, he should send an envoy and ask for the terms of peace. So then any of you who does not forsake, renounce, surrender, claim, give up to, say goodbye to, all that he has cannot be my disciple. Goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, goodbye to self-effort. Goodbye to self-confidence, goodbye to self-will, goodbye to self-centeredness, goodbye to selfishness. Goodbye, goodbye. When you leave this conference, when you leave the building tonight, I want you to just leave that old self in here. And when you go out the door, just say, goodbye. Leave that old bad attitude and get a good attitude and go out with it. Leave that old sad, sour story that you're always telling everybody that'll listen 25 times a day. Leave that self-pity and that blaming everybody else. Just leave it and say, goodbye. Been there, done that, need to do something else. Now. We're always trying to fix up everything that's wrong with us, but the Bible says that God purposely chooses, deliberately chooses what in the world would be trashed as being of no account and no value. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Can you bring my uh, pots out here, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we'll begin in about verse 27, I think. God selected deliberately chose what in the world is foolish to put the wise to shame and what the world calls weak to put the strong to shame. Can you imagine what some extremely highly educated religious person with about a string of three or four degrees behind their name who's been to every kind of Bible seminar and seminary and more Bible schools and this and that, can you imagine how it must irritate them? 
<laughs> to see somebody like me. on television in two-thirds of the world. I mean, it is really hysterically funny when you get right down to it. I mean, it is just funny. I mean, by the world's standards, I am not one iota qualified. But God has different standards. God has different standards. The Bible calls us jars of clay. <laughs> And that God chooses to use foolish people so that the glory and the grandeur might be seen to be of Him and not of them. Or I like to say, God uses cracked pots. <laughs> now, you know, if I was going out to buy a pot, any sane person in this room, if you were going to buy a pot, who would choose this one with all the cracks in it? You wouldn't want to take that home. You'd, think, well, you'd even think a person was crazy to even have that in their store. No, we'd want the one that was all polished and shined up and, and looked all nice. But God wants to show himself strong through us. Let's bring the lights down. Let me show you what happens. Now watch. There's a light in both of these pots. Now wait. In this one, the perfect pot that we would all like, the light's on, but you can't see it. Same light in here that's in the other one, but you can't see it. However, look what happens when you turn the light on in the cracked pot. I love this. So I'm just going to be a happy cracked pot. Here I am, this deliriously happy cracked pot. I'm not going to worry about my cracks. I'm not going to be upset about my cracks. I don't even care if I don't get rid of my cracks. I am just going to be a happy crack butt. Amen? I'll tell you, some of my stuff's been around so long, I'm getting kind of comfortable with it. I'm starting to like it. I have a feeling I'll always be a little sassy. My mouth may always get me in just a little bit of trouble, but I'm quick to repent. Oh, Lord, there's nobody that can repent as quick as me. I mean, I can repent when I'm still in the middle of it. Come on now, why don't you just give up being mad at yourself because you're not the perfect pot. God chooses on purpose the weak and the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He chooses what the world would throw away as trash. I thought later it was too late to do it, but I am going to get me a trash can and preach out of it one of these days. I'm going to get in that baby and I'm going to preach a whole message. Because that's where the world would have put me. In the trash can. But God. Come on, but God. But God. Poke the person next to you and say, come on, you old crackpot, praise God. Well, we need to realize that no matter what we've gone through, God does have a plan for our lives that is far greater than anything we can probably imagine. And we need to pray for God's holy intervention in our lives and into our problems.